I'm so aware of the fact that we have been kind of lulled into a bit of spectatorship in our general experience of life because so much of what we're doing is not actually in person at the moment. So we, you know, we have a Zoom call instead of a meeting in person or we have a Google meeting and we watch things on television and if we didn't book, we can't make it to the church service and so we watch online or maybe we're sitting in our pajamas, um, you know, kind of scrolling through something while the preach is happening. I'm being honest about myself here, yeah. <laughs> which is not a bad thing. It's great. It's great. But 
what I have been aware of is that there is a call from the heart of the Father for us to participate and to engage again. And so this morning as we go into worship, I really want to encourage us to do that. So I'm going to ask you to stand, whether you're at home or in the building, you can stand with us. And, you know, the Word says that when you come together, each of you has a psalm or a hymn or a spiritual song, scripture, something to bring. We all actually bring something. And this is the beautiful environment where we get to share that. And so we're going to just start off, and I want you to just start singing, start declaring, start praying in tongues, whatever you feel comfortable with. But we want to participate in joining in heaven's song this morning. So we're going to just do that. We're just going to give a moment for the Holy Spirit to just ignite the spark in us again as we participate in the divine nature with Him. doesn't have to be pretty. doesn't have to be well composed. doesn't have to be even sensical. It's just the heart that you have pouring out to the heart of the Father, just saying, God, I want to meet with you today. We've come to meet with you, God. We've come to dine with you. We've come to sup with you, God. We've come to feast. Thank you, Father, that you lay before us in the presence of our enemies a table. You call us to the feasting table, despite everything that's happening around us. And this morning we choose to come and feast with you. We choose to come and commune with you, God. We choose to come and be with you, God. Our source and our focus our King and our God. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. 
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. And I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. feeling such a sense that the power of the name of Jesus is our key today. Such a sense that Jesus wants to break through into impossible situations. I want to tell you this morning, it doesn't matter how long the problem has existed. The one who created all things, whose existence 
precedes everything. His name today can break that. I want to tell you that it doesn't matter how big the problem is. The name of Jesus is bigger than your problem. I want to tell you that it doesn't matter how complex it is. The one who stood at wisdom's side when creation was made. He is wiser than the most complex problem that you encounter. We're going to speak the name of Jesus. Last week, Shani shared about being witnesses in Jerusalem and then in Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we're going to start off just by speaking the name of Jesus over our Jerusalem right here. The problems that we're facing in the building, something that you're facing, we're going to speak Jesus over that problem. Jesus, 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 I speak Jesus, I speak Jesus, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus. You know, the temptation is to get loud, but it was in the whisper that God spoke. He wasn't in the storm, he was in the whisper. So we've spoken over Jerusalem. Now you expect to see a change. Now we're gonna speak over Judea, our area. So over Howick and the Midlands, the surrounds, anything in this area, we're going to speak Jesus. We're going to speak Jesus. 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 We speak Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that right now you are battering down the gates of hell. The Bible tells us that they will not prevail. And so right now, we speak the name of Jesus. Yours is the victory, Jesus. We expect to see plunder come into your kingdom, God. We expect to see people come into your kingdom, God. Those that you bled and died for, Jesus, in our area, Howick in the Midlands, Father. We expect to see miracles, transformations. Father, at coffee shops, at garages, in shopping centers, we expect to see your spirit break out. We declare Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now we're going to speak Jesus over our nation. Over every problem that our beautiful and broken nation faces. Over corruption, over inequality over poverty over anything that you can name or think of we're going to speak the name of Jesus thank you Jesus that you are the answer to the biggest problems thank you Jesus that you have everything in store that you want to unlock and unravel through your bride God thank you Jesus that you have a plan for this nation that your heart is towards this nation God we speak Jesus Jesus Jesus, 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 above every other name we speak Jesus, 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 over every problem and every crisis we speak Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> and Father, to the ends of the earth, we speak Jesus. We speak Jesus. Father, as we, as we face a world in a pandemic, we speak Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the blood of Jesus that has paid every price. We speak Jesus. 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 
just love Jesus so much. You know, when, when we just focus in on him, because he's the Prince of Peace, peace just enters in. It enters into the room, it enters into our space, it enters into our hearts, it enters into our minds. And I don't want to run away from this place. We're just going to linger just a little bit here. Let Jesus just speak to you. Maybe this is the first peaceful time you've had in months. Let him speak to you. Hebrews 13.5 says, He will never leave us or forsake us. Father, I want to thank you that you settle our hearts. That you give us such complete assurance that you will never leave us or forsake us. That however we may feel, you have not left us, nor have you forsaken us. You are right here with us. Make our hearts attentive to your voice. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to invite Wes up to share. Just feel the spirit moving. Just want to hand the baton well. So as we stay in a place of worship, I just want to share a little story with you. Two weeks ago, my son Dylan, he's in high school in grade 8, and we're in a lift club. And my wife and I, Corrine, we were to pick up Dylan and his buddies. We were to do the carpool that day. We both had appointments, and so I SMSed a friend of mine who had a little family group and said, hey, could someone else fetch the kids he said, no hassle, he'll do that. And um, he's part of our church. He's become a friend. And so he SMS back, said, no, no problem, he'll do it. But I must just put a good, a good word in with the man upstairs. And the pastor and me just wanted to write back and say, you don't want me to speak on your behalf. Because someone far greater has already. Jesus has stood before the Father and spoken on your behalf. But I couldn't do that to him. He was, he was just... Being a, playing a joke or but that sense didn't leave me for like two weeks just this oh man how could I ever go before the Father on your behalf when the one who is greater has already gone and then I recalled some of the things out of the book of Revelation how that heaven searched for one who was worthy worthy to open the scrolls worthy to stand on our defense worthy to be the lamb who would suffer worthy there's something about us beginning to honor his worth that changes everything you are worthy Jesus you are worthy of our praise of our adoration, of our love. You're worthy of our lives laid down in surrender. You're worthy to receive from us everything you would ask. You, Jesus, are worthy. And may we this morning, like heaven, see your worth. Like the woman with that costly oil who saw your worth. A woman with the issue of blood. You saw your worth. Father, open our hearts. Pour out a spirit of wisdom and revelation upon us this morning in the knowledge of Jesus. We have gathered in his name. We are the redeemed by his name. of that doing worship but just let your heart see his worth value him this morning
you, Father. Don't you just love Jesus? You know what's so amazing about Jesus is that we get to fall in love with Him more and more. Just when you think your heart couldn't love Him anymore, it would burst. Then you hear Him say something to you, experience Him in a way, you see Him at work in somebody else's life, and all of a sudden you're just undone by how beautiful He is, how magnificent He is. I just really felt in my heart this morning that God wanted me to stir your passion for Jesus. <laughs> and so while we were singing and while things were going on, I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. You're so good. You know, this is going to be so much easier than I thought because you're all excited about Jesus already. So what's the point, you know? But there's such, a, there's such a, um, an important call in Scripture for you and I to keep our our love for Jesus, our passion for Jesus, white hot. You know, in the Old Testament, you can read about it in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 6, somewhere around there onwards. God does an amazing thing when they're dedicating the, the, the temple. And, um, when I say temple, I mean it's the tent that they traveled with. And, um, and they, they, the, the priests are instructed to put in, um, a sacrifice on the, on the altar. And there's this moment at the end of Leviticus chapter 9, if I remember correctly, when God sets fire to that altar. And it is a glorious moment, much like when Elijah faced off against the Baal prophets. There was this miraculous show of God's power and glory. And, uh, and he consumes that offering. And in the consuming of that offering, God is pleased um, with the people of Israel. But then after that, the instruction is given is that the priests are to keep that fire burning day and night. They are not let it go out. And we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a season of grace. We live in the dispensation of grace where we have all been brought into the priesthood of every believer. And we all have an altar, so to speak, in our hearts. And it is our responsibility to keep that fire burning. To keep our passion and love for Jesus so uh, the word that came a little while ago, um, the young lady that brought the word and, um, about being in a fire. And it was difficult and it's a struggle, but it's a purifying fire, right? And you know, sometimes when we go through difficult seasons in our lives and when we suffer, it's so hard because we, we kind of want to know why we're suffering. Like, God, what's going on here? What? Ah, you know? And we have those little thoughts that we try to hide from God. Like, you know, if I was in charge, I would have done things differently. You know, I, I, might have, I might have had a better plan, Lord. I don't know what's going on here. And sometimes we can't answer the question of why. But what we can do is we can look towards Jesus. And we can see that God in Christ, though we may not have an answer for our suffering, though we may not have an answer for why we're in the place that we are, what we can see is that God is not indifferent. He's not far away and aloof. He's not uh, removed from us in such a way that He doesn't care. No, in Christ Jesus, God showed His love and His compassion for us in such a wonderful way. And Jesus hanging on the cross was a demonstration of God's love towards us and His love motivated to act. And He acted in such a way that He drew all suffering to Himself, all judgment to Himself, all shame to Himself, so that we could be set free. And even though we suffer, even though we struggle, even though we feel like the fires are raging around us. And we cannot put our finger on why. And at times we can't even get God to explain why. What we know is that He's close, that He's faithful, that He loves us, and that God has remedied our problem through His Son, Jesus. And so we constantly look to Jesus. We constantly keep our hearts and our affection towards Him. It's our responsibility to guard our hearts and to keep our hearts passionately in love with Jesus. Amen? So important. So I want to start this morning. Uh, we're going to go to Psalm 2. So if you've got your Bibles or a smartphone or whereabouts, you look at that, you, we're going to have a look at Psalm 2 in a moment. But I want to say this. You know, one of, the, one of the most important stories in the Bible for us as Christians is the Exodus story. 
And the story of how God uh, rescues the Israelite nation from bondage in Egypt, brings them out into the wilderness, and His plan is to make them a great nation. His plan is to bring them into the promise, into the promised land. And this story has many, many implications for the gospel. We see, we see the gospel, um, you know, it's almost like the Exodus story is the shadow of the gospel. And so we can understand what God is doing and how He's doing it from this Exodus story. It's very important for us to understand. But I want to make a point out of it this morning and hopefully draw us into that passionate pursuit of Jesus as our responsibility. So when God brings the Israelites out of Egypt, He delivers all of them. All of them. Young, old, and in between, every person delivered. In fact, the Bible says when they came out, there was not one feeble or sick amongst them. Man, that is glorious. They all come out well. I suppose God thought, well, they're going to walk in the desert for a while. I might as well give them the strength to do it. <laughs> but they come out and they're all delivered. But And they come out into the wilderness. But God's plan and purpose was not for them to remain in the wilderness. In fact, they were supposed to go into the promised land. All were delivered from Egypt, but not all went into the promised land. You see, there's a funny condition about us as, as Christians or as human beings is that our hearts tend to let us down. Our hearts tend to let us down. Our hearts tend to shy away. Even when the Israelites got into the promised land, God said uh, through Joshua, divide up the land, let them have this place and the hill country and the low country and all that kind of thing. And after many years, the Israelites have still not taken full possession of their inheritance. Everybody was delivered from Egypt, but not everybody made it into the promised land. And you know, as Christians, many of us fall short of what God has for us. We don't live in the promises of God, oftentimes because of the condition of this heart. The book of Revelation is a very interesting read. And uh, particularly at this time. And I'm not going to get into any of that. <laughs> All right. It's an interesting read. So, suffice to say, the, the, the book of Revelation... Its overarching theme is this. Hey, Christian. Hey, follower of Christ. Hey, lover of Jesus. Stay faithful and persevere. Don't give up. Don't stop believing in the goodness of God. Even though you might find yourself in chaos, even though you, you might find yourself or you feel like you're being engulfed by the flames, don't give up. Because your king, the lover of your soul, he's victorious in all things. And he's one. He's one, he's one, he's one. And as we keep these things in our hearts, we move more and more into the promises of God. And so often as Christians, uh, just to say this, so often as Christians, we can find ourselves, oh man, we, we wishing our lives away. Or we, when I get healed, when this happens, when this, and we, 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 we put our, our joy off until we get something from God or we have a physical manifestation from God. I want to say, if we live like that, we're throwing water on the fire. We have got to live in a present tense with Jesus, loving Him and pursuing Him. Amen. So, this funny condition of our hearts that we sometimes back away from all that God has from us. Sometimes it's easy for us to not persevere and to give up. But God wants us to move forward. He wants us to persevere. He wants us to push on in faith. He wants us to receive everything that He has for us. I want to say to you, the promises of God are not a car carrot He dangles out in front of you to kind of keep you doing the chores. He has every intention for you to receive them. He has every intention for you to live in them. He has every intention for you to live in His peace, His joy, His mercy, His grace, His provision, His healing. Every intention. But we have an enemy oftentimes who's doing his best to stop that. And then we have hearts that give up. Hearts that fall short. So we want to keep our hearts wide hot. I'm going to read to you Psalm 2. It is 12 verses. And I've got until about 20 past. Is that okay? Is that right? Yeah. It's not. Okay. Cool. So I also broke my glasses this week. I took them in to be repaired and I had to send them to Cape Town. So I'm just going to stand out here so I can see. <laughs> yeah, that might help, man. Yeah. So this is what it says. It says, why do the nations rage? 
Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take control together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break the bonds in pieces and cast away the cords from us. So this portion of, of scripture in, um, in Psalm 2 from verses 1 to 3, it, it, this is the nations and they speak and form a conspiracy against God. The nations have plotted against God. He said, man, ah, we don't like you. And then it goes on in verse 4. And he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. I love that. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So the nations have conspired against God. They rage against God. What's God's, um, his response to this? What is his emotion towards this? Oh no, what am I going to do? No, he laughs. He says, hey, Connor, what's going on here? He has a laugh. I want to say, this is how we should face our problems. When our, when our problems conspire against us, when everything seems to be going in the wrong direction, have a laugh. Have a laugh. Because nothing the enemy can do is greater than what God can undo. I remember praying for our country uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I had read something in the paper about how much money had been squandered. And I was frustrated. I'm like, you know, like every good South African is, we're just frustrated at how much money has been stolen and wasted. And, and I felt like the Lord said to me, where's the devil cannot steal more than I can restore. The devil cannot steal more than I can restore. What I, what I realized in that moment is that I had taken my eyes off what God was able to do, who he was, and I set my eyes on the, on the problem and I thought, I've got to sort this out. No, you don't. You see, this is what happens with our lives. This is what happens. And, and these moments, they cause our hearts to become cold and wearied. And frustrated. I want to tell you, we have to have a big, glorious, magnificent picture of who Jesus is. Because the enemy cannot steal from your life more than God can restore. How do you keep your heart ablaze for Jesus? You keep your heart in the truth. The enemy cannot take from your life more than God can restore. When I think about these things, I think, well, yo man, Lord, there are some tough things that we face in this life. And there's some people that have lost children. I mean, Lord, there's so many difficult things. And I felt like the Lord reminded me, where's his families in heaven? The Bible promises us that as Christians, we don't grieve without hope. Those that have gone before us, we will see again. Amen. The enemy cannot steal from your life more than God can restore. We carry this hope and this hope in us. The strength in us. God is able. Come on. Tell yourself this morning. Remind yourself this morning. God is able. Not only is he able, just like the leper found out, he is willing. He is faithful. God is able. They conspire against God. And God has a laugh. Verse 7, he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I want to say to you this morning, God had a plan and he had it in Jesus. And everything belongs to him. Everything belongs. Why am I preaching this at you this morning and at myself? Because I know a lot of Christians that complain and moan and groan and find themselves in places of difficulty because they don't know this to be true. We pray like God has forsaken South Africa. We pray like God doesn't have a plan for the nations. They belong to Jesus. They're His. They're His possession. And every wicked ruler will one day give an account for what He put them over what he allowed them over 
you know, again, these are, these are big ideas for us to hold close to our hearts. Why? Because they help us reason through the trouble to go, man, Jesus, you're in charge. You're faithful. The enemy cannot steal from our life more than you can restore. You're greater than. And so we face every problem with a certainty. Jesus is my victory. Jesus is my portion. Jesus is my champion. You know, I think the church should be defined by a sense of, I was going to say arrogance, but not, not arrogance, because that's not, because we live with humility. But there should be this defiance in our hearts against all that the enemy is trying to do. We're not going to be taken in by that. Because he's so much bigger, so much more glorious. It goes on to say, Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Take him serious. It says, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. Now, we don't have time to dissect all of this in line with the current covenant of grace that we live under. Okay, so I know you might have some, some questions reading the Psalms. Speak to Matt when he's back. Grab one of the elders. They'll be able to work you through it, okay? The line that intrigues me is, kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Now, you, you've got to think about this for a moment, because Psalm 2 has been written maybe over a thousand years ago to a group of people who had no idea about the coming Messiah. No cooking clue. And we know that to be true, because when Jesus did arrive, they were all a little bit, unsure <laughs> they weren't looking for a, a messiah riding on a donkey they were looking for a messiah riding uh, on a on a horse with a sword and an agenda to take out the romans and and so they, they didn't know what we they, pardon me they couldn't read into the story they couldn't read into the psalm what you and i can read in who's the son jesus clearly it is and the command is to kiss him the command is to kiss him. Now, it's very, very interesting to me. That word kiss in the Hebrew is the word nasach. Nasach. Now, it is a homonym. Anybody know what a homonym is? Come on, Mr. Teacher. <laughs> so, let me give you a quick little lesson. You'll remember this from high school English. A homonym is a word that sounds the same but has different meanings. Bank. Bank. Okay, come on. You can have a river bank and you can go to a bank. And you can draw money out of a bank or you can deposit money in a bank. But we need to, in the context, be able to understand what bank we're talking about. See. You see with your eyes. You spell it differently when you come to the C where I live. Or you can talk about the letter C. It sounds exactly the same, but it has different meanings. Well, this word for kiss is one of those Hebrew words. It, it sounds the same, but it has different meanings. It has different meanings. And so we can interpret it to mean kiss. Kiss the sun. Mwah. Give him a kiss. But the root of this word comes from a Hebrew word, which means to kindle a fire. To kindle a fire. Now that makes perfect sense, right? Because generally, well, we've got to put that in context too, but... But if I kiss my wife, man, there's a fire brewing. The fire speaks of passion, right? It speaks of love. It speaks of intimacy. You see, when we hold good theology in our minds, when we understand who God is and how we relate to Him, that He's faithful and good and kind and just, that He's delivered us, that He owns the nations, what it does is it opens the door to not fight with all these other things but to go to the sun and kiss him. To be drawn in for intimacy. It's so hard to go and be intimate with Jesus when all you can think about is the fact that you need more money to pay another bill. It's so hard to go and be intimate with Jesus when all that we're preoccupied is with our current needs. We need to put them aside knowing that he's dealt with him faithfully. He promised to take care of every one of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He didn't say, I'm going to take care of all of your needs according to Bill Gates' riches in Christ Jesus. Because he's got way more than Bill Gates has. 
The point is, is that God is there to provide for us. And so when we understand this truth that he's faithful and just and God, he holds all of this in the balance and I can come to him to kiss the sun, to be intimate with, with him, to keep the fires burning, to kindle the fire, to keep the fire going. So this word nasat means it comes from the root to kindle a fire. It means kiss, but it also means this, to equip for war. Whew. You can go look it up. You don't have to take my word for it. Go get a Strong's Dictionary. It's right there. You can go read some, some, uh, some theologians who talk about the Hebrew. It means to equip for war, to arm for battle. To arm for battle. You can go read, there's some scriptures in, in 1 Chronicles, if I remember correctly, to arm for battle. The other thing that it means is to rule. So it comes from the root to kindle a fire. It means to kiss. It's this picture of intimacy. But it also can mean to be armed for battle. And it could mean to rule. So what does that look like? Well, we find the picture of this word in the person of David. Who's David? David's a friend of God. He's a friend of God. He's someone who the Lord says, man, this boy's got my heart. What do we know about David? Well, David, uh, as a young man, he penned so many of the Psalms. He was a musician. He sang to the Lord. He worshipped to the Lord. He, he, was, he was brave and fearless. I think to myself, why was he brave and fearless? Because he was intimate with the Lord. There's something very different about a person when they, when they know that Jesus is with them. When they know that He's faithful. There's something so different about how they face the problems of this life. You may go to the doctor, the doctor says, you're going to die. And they go, oh no, thank, thank you for that opinion, doctor. But you know what? That's not, that's not me. Because Jesus is with me. Because He is faithful. There's something different about a person who lives like that. And so David is this young man who lives in intimacy with the Lord. He lives in fellowship with the Father. He's constantly worshiping. He's constantly loving on the Lord. He's singing to the Father. He's writing songs to Him. He's, a, he's processing all of his emotion, all of the struggle in his life through the lens of understanding who God is. And then we find David as a young boy stepping onto a battlefield to face a giant. And all of that intimacy with Jesus, all of that inti intimacy with the Father did what? It readied him for war. He has an encounter with Saul and Saul says, hey, put on my armor. <laughs> Go there. And He's like, no, 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 I don't need any of that. It doesn't fit. It's, uh, I don't need that. I just need five stones and a slingshot. And David goes down into that valley to face Goliath. And he's armed for war. He's armed for the battle. Why? I'd like to believe because he knew how to be intimate with the Father. I don't know about you, but I am nearly 44 years old. If you stuck me in the bush with a lion, I'd run in the, the opposite direction. If you asked me to step in the boxing ring with a bear, I would leave the room. Somehow David wasn't intimidated by either of those animals. Because he lived in a place of intimacy with the Father. He had learned to kiss the Son. And so he goes on, steps onto that battlefield. You know the story. He takes down Goliath by God's grace. But as he takes down Goliath, you know what happens? A door opens for him to become a ruler. You see, this is what happens. You and I want to rule. And God says, well, I want you to rule too. But I need you to walk with me over here in intimacy. When God called Moses and Aaron to go and speak to Pharaoh, what, would, what did he ask them to say to Pharaoh? He said, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they can come and worship me in the wilderness. Come and worship me in the wilderness. I think, wow. You see, God knew that if they could learn to be intimate with him, to trust him, to rely on him, to lean into his faithfulness, then there was nothing that they could not possess in the promised land. When Moses takes those 12 spies to the edge of the promised land and sends them in, two, two guys come back. Oh, man. It is awesome, people. Let's go. Ten guys are like, no, no, no. Not good. Not today. I want to say that's why we don't leave things up to a vote, eh? We do what the Father says. We do what the Father says. But nonetheless, they miss out on what God has for them. Why? 
I really believe that when the Israelites went out into the wilderness, they didn't get right that idea of worship. When they come to the mountain, <laughs> they're actually afraid. You can go read the story. They said to Moses, Moses, you go up the mountain. We'll stay down here. And whatever you guys decide, we're in on it. <laughs> they forsook intimacy. You know, you can have a, relation, a relationship with God vicariously through your pastor. It's not what God's called you to have. If this is the only moment of intimacy and a place of connection with the Father on a Sunday here in church, then it's not a good thing. It's because every moment you take to kiss the Son, every moment you take to be in His presence, every moment you take to learn from the Scriptures, you are ready for war. Every moment you take to be in His presence and have Him shape your heart, you are ready to rule. This is God's plan and purpose for your life. And we see it all through the scriptures. There's a moment. How much time have I got here? No, 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 no. Don't do that to a pastor. I was that. I know we've gone over plenty, haven't we? Nobody's left, <laughs> but they might leave angry. <laughs> I'll end with this. I'll end with this. There's a, a beautiful. There's, there's four stories in each one of the Gospels, the three synoptic Gospels and in the book of John. And they tell the story of Jesus' Jesus's anointing. And the Bible tells us there's this woman who comes to Jesus and she has this very costly perfume. And she comes into a crowded room full of important people and she's not so important. In fact, she's not so important uh, because she's a sinner. <laughs> Because she's been de de defined by all the mess she's got herself into. And she anoints Jesus. I think in the book of Luke it says that she kisses his feet. And with her hair she washes his feet and washes his hands and she anoints his, his, um, his head. And it's this beautiful picture of intimacy, this love and affection for Jesus. And this love and affection that so radicalizes this lady that she pushes through the social boundaries. She goes where she's not welcome. She goes where she's not invited just so that she can get to Jesus. May we be like that woman, Lord. And in the Synoptic Gospels, she's never named. She's just a woman. The woman. But John names her. John names her. He tells us it's Mary. Let me just catch myself. He tells us it's Mary. And Mary, as we understand, was demon-possessed and had all these issues, and Jesus set her free. And she was so in love with Jesus because she had been forgiven so much. That's what Luke tells us in his telling of the story. It's just amazing. And John says to us, no, this is not a no-name lady. This is Mary. A few chapters before John tells us it's Mary. He tells us another story. In John chapter 10. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. And Martha, her sister, is in the kitchen. And Martha gets mad. Mad. It's one thing to get mad. You know, and just kind of keep it to yourself. But you know when someone's mad and they let you know about it, they're really mad. Do you know what I mean? So Martha stopped just thinking about it in the kitchen. She gets out there and she's like, oh man, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? I'm laboring in the kitchen. My sister's sitting here doing, she's just sitting here listening to you. What's going on? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about much. But Mary has chosen that good thing. To sit at my feet and hear my word. You see, David, because he spent time with the Lord, he was in the right place at the right time to do for the Lord what only he could do. But it's true for Mary too. You see, Mary pursued Jesus. And instead of being in the kitchen, it was a woman's place, not to offend anybody. The ancient Near East women weren't taught the scriptures. She bucked the system. <laughs> but why wouldn't she? She went where she wasn't welcome before to anoint him, right? And she sits there and chooses that good thing. And Mary, just like David, she did for Jesus. She was at the right place at the right time to do for Jesus what only she could do. Anoint him for his death. 
because it would some, come so quickly they wouldn't be able to do that. She gave Jesus an honor. Why? Because she pursued intimacy over what was the right thing to do. She kept her heart ablaze for the one who had loved her enough to set him free. Family, you know why you owe him your life. I know why I owe him my life. And I want to keep my heart in that place. I don't want to be undone and overcome by all the whys. I don't know. But what I do know is that he stepped out of heaven and he stepped into my mess. And he hung on a cross. He did something that nobody else could. In Jesus' suffering, we think of him just as a man. No, he was God as much as he was man. You know, if an animal, and I, we love that. We've got animal, beautiful animals. We've got dogs. When, when an animal gets hurt, you take it to the vet and you, man, we've paid thousands of rands too. I feel like I'm still paying off for my animals. But, you know, we pay for them. But uh, we love animals. But I can tell you now, that animal does not suffer in the same way that you and I suffer. And I want to say to you, our suffering is nothing to be compared to his suffering because he was God. And I want to tell you, God suffers in a greater way than we did. And he gave his life to save you and I. Don't get caught up by the why. Pursue him with all that you have. Get close to him. Kiss the sun. Because in kissing the sun, you'll be equipped for the battles of this life. And more than that, it'll set you up to rule. Rule over your enemies. Rule over your circumstances. Rule with Christ. Why? Because it's who you've become. You are seated together with Him in heavenly places. Amen. I say this not to belittle the struggle that you've been through or the circumstances that you've had to deal with. They're painful. But Jesus is greater. Keep your heart towards Him. Remember the strategy of the enemy. Daniel says, one of the strategies of the enemy is to weary out the saints. To just keep coming at you until you go, Enough! I can't do this anymore. But Jesus is more than enough. Amen.
I'm fearful 